grace to you, dear friends. And also to you. If you wouldn't mind, join me to say the prayer, O Jesus, living in Mary, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Jesus, living in Mary, come and live in your servants, in the spirit of your holiness, in the fullness of your power, in the perfection of your ways, in the reality of your virtues, in the communion of your mysteries. Have dominion over every adverse power in your own spirit, to the glory of the Father. Amen. Today, we'll talk on confess. So we'll begin our two-part teaching um, that will be specifically focusing on the sacrament of reconciliation. So we decided to give it the theme, confess part one and confess part two. It's part of the whole series on word for a wounded world. And I look at the teachings of today and the one that will come next as the crucial aspect of the Word for the Wounded World series. Once a priest was hearing the confession of first Holy Communion candidates, little children, and a young boy came in and said, Father, bless me, Father, follow the normal way of confession. And after that, he said, I have finished, Father. Now, tell me your sins. <laughs> so, you see, the, the sacrament of reconciliation, what we call confession, is a sacrament that is mostly misunderstood by many people. Well, I don't blame so many people. Because unless things are properly explained, unless they understand it, they may not really get what is happening in this great sacrament. That's why I felt that we use two of our teachings to explore deeper and deeper into it. It's not in, no, in any way close to the great teaching you will find in the Catechism of the Catholic Church about this great sacrament, but I'll try as much as possible to use simple examples to relate it to us. No matter how we claim it, no matter how we pretend that we don't want to confess, there are many ways people have chosen to confess. It's like you decide not to go the Bible way, the normal way, but you do it the other way. And I will show us about six different ways that people have chosen a short court to confess, or short court to confession. But in the end, they don't get the absolution and the forgiveness of sins as required. I've, my principle has always been this. If you can get a bigger portion, why go for the small one? If you can get a bigger blessing, why settle for the small blessing? If the sacrament of reconciliation gives the greater opportunity of reconciliation with God and reconciliation with his people, the church, and reconciliation even with yourself, why not use it? So take note, number one, there are people who prefer to disclose their sins in public, like in talk shows. There are people who like to confess to a psychologist. I'm using that confess in parentheses. They would like to confess to a psychologist. The third group of people are people who like to confess unto themselves. I call it solitary confession. There are those who like to confess to the masses, the fourth group. The fifth group are those who confess to, who like to claim the text of James and uh, interpret it in a way that is, it fits them, confess to one another. I will go into all that. And those who claim that, unquote, salvation by grace 
overrides confession. <laughs> we shall briefly look into all these claims. Number one, those who prefer public disclosure of sins. These people would like to disclose their sins. They won't call it sin anyway. They don't want to call it sin. They want to call it weakness or things like that. No, 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 no. Don't mention sin. <laughs> they will talk about their dirty lies, the vulgarity and different aspects of misconduct. They would like to do it on some talk shows. They call it mistakes. My mistakes. Not my sins. Have you heard about such people? Have you watched some of them on TV? My mistakes. No, my mistakes. It's my mistakes. Not sin. No, how, no matter how financial benefits connected with this kind of show, huh? the truth remains that there is no true forgiveness of sin. There is no absolution. The person goes back in his or her inner room dying for the same sin. No matter how we cover truth, truth will remain. There are others who like to go and confess to the psychologist. This does not in any way underrate or downplay the great work psychologists do. Man, we have our psychological aspect that deserves psychological well-being. That's not what I'm talking about here. But there are people who go to the psychologist and they like to, instead of going to a priest for moral issues, they would like to, everything is psychologism, everything is psychologized. There is this story told by a priest Father Wade Menezes. Father Wade Menezes shared it, and I want to share the same story with you. It's about a priest who was invited for a dinner, and the priest went and sat side by side a psychologist, a clinical psychologist. And the priest, in order to show that he belonged or to socialize, whatever, with that man, said, oh, you know, you and I do the same kind of job. The psychologist looked at him and said, no, we don't. The priest said, I mean, you and I do similar <laughs> kind of jobs. <laughs> the psychologist goes again, no, we don't. The priest went a third time. I mean, people come to see me as they come to see you. They come to you and tell you things in confidence as they come to me and tell me things in confidence. They tell you their private lives and their sins as they come to me and tell me their private lives and their sins at the confessional. Is that not correct? The man said, no. When pre people come to you, they admit their sins up front. But when they come to me, they blame their weaknesses on other people. Second, they pay me $146 per hour to come see me, but yours is free. <laughs> this, is, this is a story but there is lesson behind that story. The two are not the same thing. Psychological well-being is different from spiritual well-being. Visiting a psychologist does not take away, take away the great opportunity of reconciliation when we find ourselves morally culpable and spiritually unfit. So we need to afford ourselves this opportunity of great reconciliation, which can only be found at the confessional, not at the clinic. 
There are others who like to confess what they call it solitary confession. They just go in their inner room and lock themselves up in their inner room and they are, if you like, soliloquizing. They'll be talking on the, to the air. You know, there is, you know, guilt is powerful. No matter how we deny it, guilt is powerful. There is this saying that guilt is to the soul what pain is to the body. It is the sign that something is wrong. And when people have guilt, and if they don't have the right way to vent it, if they don't write the right approach to handle it, they can also be just soliloquizing and talking and, in the, and getting crazy sometimes. Little surprise, we see so many people who are in this kind of attitude, drinking too much, going into depression, going into this kind of perverse kind of lifestyle because it is too much to be contained. They need to explore the great opportunity, the great grace moment which the Lord has provided for people like there are. And they don't need to pay for it. They don't need to travel too distant for it. In every city in the world, there is a Catholic church. Virtually in every city, virtually. Even in China, in big cities in China, in Japan, even in Arab countries, you will see, even if it is a little Catholic church, where there is a great opportunity for you to vent that guilt, that thing that is eating deep into you and making you not be happy as you should be. God wants you to be happy, my friend. Why not use it? There are those who like to confess to the masses. They confess to <laughs> this kind of confession, we see it more or less on TVs and we hear it through radios and through the internet and all those blah, blah, blah. When they want to confess, they have a press conference. Have you seen it before? Press conference. Press conference for confession. You know what I call it? Huh? I call it the politicization of confession. The politicization of confession. And this takes place only, it's not by their own will. It is only after their secret lives have been discovered by some reporters or by some police or by some kind of thing. All of a sudden, all of a night, they become born again and they call a press conference, I have repented. There must be the press to cover it. Otherwise, they have not made the point. There must be the press. We must have cameramen. Eh? We must have the radio and the TV to broadcast it. Unfortunately, we see this kind of confession in some religious, among some religious groups. All of a sudden, somebody who used to be a bad guy has met Christ, and for him to confess, it must be a press conference. And after that, what happens? He begins a church. <laughs> One time thief, now a pastor. One time rogue, now a pastor. By the way, I'm not passing a value judgment. I'm not making judgment. I'm not condemning anybody. Because God only knows the sincerity of the heart. That's not, this is totally out of, so that we don't take light what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that it has happened, especially in the 80s and the 70s and the, in some parts of Africa. It became a trend. God knows the sincerity of those people. But my only concern is, and this is, should, this should be the concern of every reasonable person. Why must 
every of such or most of such confessions lead to the same person, the culprit, founding a church and not answering to any authority. Because true repentance is a redisposition, a true disposition to become answerable to an authority. Because if you're not answerable to an authority, how do you guarantee that the old life is totally changed? This is common sense. Even though <laughs> common sense is not that common. <laughs> there are those also who like to confess to one another. These ones are close to the scripture. They will quote you James chapter 5, verse 16. We will read it. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I've always advised people when you read the Bible, read it in context. The church teaches us, read the Catechism, that when we read the Bible, we try to get the senses of the Scripture. You know, every aspect of the Scripture, you can get a, a, a greater appreciation of what the Bible is talking about when you understand the context. When you read this this way, and you don't read the whole context, you don't understand the message passed here. Let's read the whole context. It begins with verse number 13, running down to 20. Is anyone among you suffering? That's the question. Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, therefore, conditional, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effect. So what is the main theme of this text? The sacrament of anointing of the sick. That's the main context. He's talking about the role of the community of faith to the healing of the sick or the wounded. And then talked about confessing to one another. When people interpret this and don't incorporate the aspect of talk to the leader of the community, the prayer of faith by the leader can bring that healing. They lose the context of this message. Even though an aspect of it is about confession, but that aspect that is about confession is contextualized in the ecclesia. That's why it brings the dimension of the leader of the community. Read the Bible in context. I will not go details into this. Let's continue. I will talk more about it in the next part. There are the other group who will say, well, we are saved by grace. We are saved by grace and we don't need confession again. Have you heard this phrase, once saved, always saved? Have you heard it before? That's heresy. That's dangerous. When God saves us, as God has saved us in Christ, that's objective salvation. You have to respond to that objective salvation. And it is an ongoing thing. You don't say, I have given my life totally to Jesus, and I am that saved. You have to continue. That's why our Lord Jesus Christ told you, told us, 
take your cross every day and follow me. And in another place he said, anyone who hold, who hold the plow and look back is not worthy of me. Spirituality, Christian spirituality is a daily ongoing commitment. It is not once saved, always saved philosophy. That is an ideology. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not an ideology. Christianity is about a person, and that person is our Lord Jesus Christ. And to belong to that person, incorporation in, into that person, is to be a member of his body. And when you're a member of this body, you become functional in that body by daily renewing yourself through the means of salvation he had provided in Scripture, in living tradition, for that body to become alive again in a wounded world. Once said, always said philosophy is a heresy. I will explain this more in the next teaching. True confession, therefore, begins with acknowledgement. Acknowledgement of personal responsibility when you sin. And that's what we see in the story, the three stories of forgiveness, especially the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. When the son said, I will leave this place, he has started that personal acknowledgement of his fault. We have to personally acknowledge that we are guilty. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. It is that same personal responsibility that we see in the person of somebody like Zacchaeus when he said to the Lord, I will do this. If I had duped anybody, I will return it fourfold. I will divide my property and I will give to the poor. That is his personal acknowledgement of what he had done and started to re do restitution for it. True confession begins with that acknowledgement. If we don't acknowledge that we have sinned, we are making God a liar. We read from 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mind you, St. John writes to the Christian community, so he was telling those who were already saved, in parentheses, advising them to confess. We read from Scripture over and over again, different parts of Scripture. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short the glory of God. If you say you have not sinned, we read in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 10, the continuation of what I've read before, you make God a liar. God is not a liar. So we have to recognize and acknowledge we have sinned. A greedy person, for instance, must not pretend that his greed does not stand in the way of his neighbor's well-being. He cannot claim that his greed does not cause his neighbor some harm, some injury. We must acknowledge that. We must not be insensitive to the fact that if we bear false witness against our neighbor in the village, that that is detrimental to their welfare. We must acknowledge that. We must. Unless we do, we are ignoring the first step that should lead us to the true confession. In the Gospel of Luke, we see 
our Lord Jesus Christ, or more or less in the Gospel of Matthew, tell us about the need of this acknowledgement. If you are offering your gifts at the altar, and then remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go first, be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gifts. Matthew 5. Acknowledgement. So when we acknowledge, we have sinned. We start a journey of reconciliation with God and his people. And thus, we begin a journey of healing. Healing of our wounds. Our moral wounds. Our spiritual wounds. And that journey is completed at the confessional. God love you and God bless you.